So we're going to talk through um, our first topic related to the cardiovascular system. So this is blood histology and typing. And we're going to talk first about different functions of blood. So blood does a lot of different things for us. So we can basically take this and divide it up into big categories of functions. So one major function of blood is going to be transportation. So it does this in a couple different ways. Number one, it's going to deliver um, oxygen from the lungs to the tissues. It's going to deliver carbon dioxide from the tissues um, where it's generated as a metabolic waste product and take it back to the lungs so that we can um, expire it into the um, atmosphere. It's going to absorb nutrients from the digestive system um, heading into the bloodstream to be carried uh, to different tissues in the body. Um, blood also serves to transport hormones because hormones are going to be released from endocrine, um, endocrine organs throughout the body. Uh, they're secreted and they're carried in the bloodstream to target organs um, at a distant site. So in all of these ways, um, blood helps to transport uh, different um, substances in our body. Blood also serves to regulate um, processes. So it helps us to maintain our body temperature because it's going to distribute heat. It helps to maintain um, our normal pH in our body, our homeostatic pH, um, and it also helps to maintain adequate fluid volume um, to make sure that um, we get enough blood flow traveling to all of our organs to adequate, adequately supply them with blood. Blood also serves um, to protect us. So it does this in a couple different ways. It's going to help prevent blood loss. So when we have um, either minor tears to the um, inside wall of the, of the blood vessels, it's going to help to heal those. Also when we have larger um, injuries, platelets uh, that circulate in the bloodstream their function is to form blood clots. And so they're going to prevent blood loss. And so blood is protective um, against damage. It also helps us to prevent infection because we have antibodies and white blood cells that are circulating in our blood and they are ready um, to help defend us when, when they're called upon. So just some characteristics of blood. Blood accounts for about 8% of your total body weight. Um, males tend to have a little bit um, more just in terms of absolute volume of blood. So they're going to be closer to about 5 to 6 liters. Um, females have slightly less, about 4 to 5 liters. And it's basically, this is primarily due to body size. So males tend to have a larger body size than females do. Uh, the pH of blood um, is fairly neutral. It tends to um, stay within a range of 7.35 to 7.45. Uh, and again, that's, um, you know, homeostatic um, in nature. And then just as a reminder, blood is connective tissue. It's a type of connective tissue, right? All connective tissue um, arises from mesenchyme. If you think back about our tissue, um, topic. So blood is connective tissue just like bone and ligaments and um, tendons and that sort of thing. So when we look at blood, we can, we can take blood as a category and we can divide it into two different components. So we've got the plasma, which is going to be more like the liquid component of blood. And then we've got formed elements. Okay, and so formed elements we can think of as more the cells. Now we don't really call it the cells because technically two out of the three formed elements that we found in blood are not truly cells. Um, but that's that's what that's what we're looking at here. Formed elements are going to be more the um, the cellular components of blood. Plasma is going to be more the liquid. So if you look at plasma, what what is plasma made out of? So plasma is mostly water, just like a lot of things in the body. So about 90% of plasma is water. It's going to be like the fluid component 
of blood. And it's basically surrounding the formed elements. Okay, so it's going to be more the liquid. Plasma contains over a hundred different solutes and the solutes are going to be either dissolved or suspended in water and we're going to talk about um, specifically what those are. And the fact that this is mostly water and it's fluid helps us to absorb and dissipate um, body heat. So some examples of solutes in the plasma include electrolytes. Okay, so we have lots of electrolytes and they are going to be either cations or anions. We've got sodium, potassium, magnesium, um, chloride, phosphate, bicarb. And basically the role of all of these electrolytes is to maintain plasma osmotic pressure, okay, which is basically to maintain fluid volume in the plasma so that all of the plasma doesn't leak out of the blood vessels and to maintain pH. Also in the plasma, we've got proteins. Okay, And so the main role of proteins in the plasma, if we have, here's a blood vessel, okay, and we've got proteins that are here. And really the main, the main protein that we're talking about here is going to be albumin. That's one of the main ones. And this is a large protein. And it's basically, it's produced by the liver. And it's a, it's a carrier. But it's really big, and so it's not able to leave the bloodstream. So actually, proteins that are inside the plasma, that are, that are um, in the blood vessels, tend to pull water into the blood vessels with them. Okay, And we're going to talk about this when we talk about um, blood vessels and the different pressures that we see. But we call this our colloid osmotic pressure. Okay, and what this does is this essentially sucks fluid into the blood vessels. Okay, and the reason that we're able to do this is because these proteins are so big they can't leave so they end up sucking fluid, sucking that water into the blood vessel with them. Okay, so in that way they maintain the osmotic pressure um, in order to control the amount of fluid that we have in the plasma. So albumin is a, is a prime example of this. We also have globulins, which are going to be like transport proteins, um, and then fibrinogen, which is a um, protein that's like a thread um, that helps us to form blood clots. Okay. Um, Continuing with solutes in the plasma, we also have non-protein um, nitrogenous based waste products. So these are going to be byproducts of cellular metabolism. These include urea, uric acid, and creatine. Um, and generally, uh, blood serves to transport these to the kidneys where we're going to excrete them as metabolic waste products. We also carry nutrients in our plasma. So we eat food. Um, it's going to become, um, you know, absorbed in our digestive tract. Maybe here's our stomach and not much absorption is going on there. But then we start going through our small intestines. Well, nutrients from the small intestines get absorbed into the bloodstream, right? So here's a blood vessel. And we're going to absorb nutrients from the digestive tract into the blood vessel to be carried to other parts of the body. So this is going to include glucose, we've got carbohydrates, um, amino acids um, for protein breakdown, fatty acids, triglycerides, cholesterol, and vitamins. So all of those nutrients are going to be absorbed and um, moved from the digestive tract into the blood vessels to be carried. Respiratory gases are also going to be carried in uh, the blood vessels. And so when we um, inspire, I'm trying to draw some lungs here, if you're wondering what that is. <laughs> so when we inspire oxygen and we pull oxygen in from our atmosphere, oxygen 
is going to diffuse into um, the blood vessels. So here's maybe a blood vessel, a capillary going through the lungs. Right? And so oxygen is going to diffuse into the blood vessel. And then also, let's say that blood vessel is carrying um, carbon dioxide from the tissues. And carbon dioxide is going to end up diffusing out and back into the atmosphere. So that oxygen needs to be carried to our tissues um, and carbon dioxide is being carried from the tissues back to the lungs so that we can exhale it and get rid of it as a metabolic waste product. Um, and we touched on this before, hormones. So we've got um, hormones that are being secreted by endocrine glands and they enter the bloodstream they're going to actually attach to those plasma proteins that act as carriers and travel to um, target organs through the bloodstream. Okay. Okay. So that was that was plasma. So if you if you think back, remember our blood here. I always think it's helpful to remember how things are organized. So we had plasma. And now here on the other side, we have formed elements. And we've got um, three different types of formed elements, okay? So the first type is gonna be erythrocytes, otherwise known as red blood cells or RBCs. Erythrocytes is kind of the fancy term for it. Um, leukocytes, which are gonna be white blood cells. And then platelets is gonna be our third type of formed element. So what we see here is that all of these formed elements, erythrocytes and white blood cells, leukocytes and platelets, all come from the same stem cell. Okay, so they all arise from the same hematopoietic stem cell, and that's going to end up creating red blood cells and white blood cells and the cells that eventually fragment and become platelets. Okay. Um, and this is what it looks like if we, if we take a blood smear, this is what it would look like underneath a microscope. And all of the space in between the cells is going to be plasma. Um, these larger, kind of more complicated cells would be white blood cells, different types of white blood cells. And these little guys here are going to be red blood cells. And I always describe them, they look like donuts because they're a little lighter in the middle. And so they're like the donut shaped ones. And then you're gonna see these little tiny fragment, these little tiny pieces of, of cells that are located through here, and those are gonna be your platelets. Okay, um, I just wanted to, hold on. Let me, I do wanna back up. I wanna to touch base on this. Here, when you go to the doctor's office and they take out blood, they take out whole blood, if they centrifuged it down, and it divides it into the different components. Well, what's gonna happen is the heaviest components are gonna to sink to the bottom, okay? And so what we have is um, the way that whole blood is gonna divide up. So erythrocytes are going to be the heaviest part of the blood. So they are actually gonna to sink to the bottom. So this is gonna be your red blood cells or your erythrocytes, okay? And erythrocytes account for about 45% of your whole blood. So we have red blood cells, and they're going to be about 45% of, of the total blood volume. Now, that's actually a clinical measurement that we can do in the lab, and that's called hematocrit. Okay. Um, and red blood cells are the most dense component, and that's why they, they sink to the bottom. And so then the next component is going to be the buffy coat, and that's what we call kind of this little line in the middle. And that's going to be about 1% of blood. And Buffy coat consists of both white blood cells and platelets. Okay, so both of those account for about 1% of our total blood volume. Okay, and then the rest of your blood, 
is going to be plasma. So the plasma or the liquid component of it is going to be the kind of the least dense component. So it's going to rise to the top. So it's going to be this part up here. And that's going to account for about 55% of your blood. So most of your blood is plasma or the liquid part of it. Um, and then we've got red blood cells and then we've got our buffy coat. So, you know, if I, if I were to ask you a question like, okay, which component of, of whole blood contains um, the formed elements responsible for blood clotting, that would be blood clotting is platelets and platelets are contained within the buffy coat. So if buffy coat was an answer there, that would be the correct answer. It's contained in the buffy coat component of, of your blood. Okay, so there's our smear. So let's talk a little bit more about our formed elements, um, specifically erythrocytes. So erythrocytes are kind of interesting. They have no nucleus. So this is like, this is mature red blood cells. Okay, immature red blood cells do have a nucleus that they eject um, shortly after they're formed. So mature red blood cells have no nucleus and are therefore um, not true cells and are not able to replicate, right? So that means that they have a finite lifespan, right? Because there's no DNA and they can't and they can't replicate. So basically they live their life and then they are recycled, you know, into parts. So um, red blood cells are shaped like, like a biconcave disc and that's how you hear them described. And that's basically this, you know, um, form here where they're basically thinner in the middle. You know, you've got this kind of indented part here and indented part here, there's your biconcave disc. Um, they do not contain organelles. Um, so they're basically just kind of bags of, of formed elements. They're very flexible. Um, they can kind of bend and twist, and they can actually travel through capillaries that are smaller than they are. They're formed by this process called hematopoiesis. Um, this is what we see in red bone marrow um, because that's where hematopoiesis takes place. And typically we see this in the flat bones of the axial skeleton or the proximal epiphyses of um, humerus and femur. So that's where hematopoiesis is going to take take place. And this is just a reminder to you, here's our red bone marrow, right, because it's located in spongy bone. And here's the fact that um, here's our hematopoietic stem cell, and it's going to create all of these cell types, right, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Erythrocytes are really interesting. They um, are a great example of complementarity. Think back, what, what was complementarity? That was a big concept. So that's this whole relationship between form and function of structures in the body, right? So the reason why erythrocytes are a great example of this is because erythrocytes' role is to carry oxygen in the blood, okay? So what's interesting here is that erythrocytes lack mitochondria, meaning that they generate ATP through anaerobic pathways. They do not require oxygen in order to generate ATP. So as a result, they do not need any of the oxygen that they carry. They are highly efficient at carrying that oxygen because they're not burning it up the whole time it's traveling through the bloodstream. And the way that these guys are shaped, this biconcave shape, gives a large surface area for gas exchange to happen. Um, and the whole um, reason why red blood cells are great at what they do is that they are over 97% hemoglobin. We're going to talk about what hemoglobin does for them. But they are basically, that's all they are, is hemoglobin, which allows them to carry oxygen oxygen carriers, um, and they don't mess around with any, you know, needless organelles in them. So they don't, they're not wasting any space on organelles or even a nucleus. They are basically just oxygen transport, and they're very good at it.
Um, so this is what they look like. So inside the red blood cells, we have what's called hemoglobin. Okay. And so this is going to be inside our red blood cells. And this is why we kind of describe red blood cells as bags of hemoglobin, because they're kind of bendy and twisty, um, and they don't contain organelles, don't even contain a nucleus. But basically what we see is that hemoglobin is um, a protein, and um, what we have is a globin protein that is bound to a red heme pigment, okay? And that's those two together are going to form hemoglobin. So these globin proteins have four polypeptide chains. And so this is what we see here. And I usually, I usually, when I draw these out, I kind of draw them looking like this. So here's my globin protein. So this whole thing right here is a globin protein. And each of these little individual loops is going to be a polypeptide chain. Okay, and what we have at the center of each of these polypeptide chains is a heme group. Probably should have drawn that in red because it, it is red in color, but okay, so here's our here's our heme group. Okay, at the center. Now what happens is that the heme group binds with an atom of iron and that's going to bind with an oxygen molecule. Okay, so we're going to have heme group bind to an atom of iron, bind to a molecule of oxygen. So we have the, oops, the ability to bind four molecules of oxygen because we've got four polypeptide chains each one has a heme group in the center, and each of those heme groups has the ability to bind an oxygen molecule. So each hemoglobin um, molecule, which this would be one hemoglobin molecule, this is one hemoglobin molecule here, can transport four molecules of oxygen, okay? And, and we call that fully saturated. Okay, so if this molecule of hemoglobin was fully saturated, it would have four oxygen molecules bound to it. Okay, um, what's interesting to note is that each red blood cell contains like 250 million hemoglobin molecules. I mean, that's crazy. And if each of those hemoglobin molecules can contain or can, can carry four molecules of oxygen, so we would say 250 million times four, that gives us one billion molecules of oxygen for each red blood cell. So that's just kind of some staggering numbers there. Um, when we have oxygen binding to the iron in hemoglobin, the hemoglobin actually changes shape and undergoes a conformational change and it turns bright red. And we call this oxyhemoglobin. And so this is when oxygen is um, bound to the hemoglobin. It's bright red. And this is why arterial blood tends to be bright red in color. Arterial blood with increased oxygen content. Okay, so it's carrying oxygen. Now on the flip side of things, when we get to the tissues, the oxygen is going to leave the um, bloodstream and travel into the tissue. And at that point, it's going to detach and it leaves deoxygen, deoxyhemoglobin, or reduced hemoglobin, which is a dark red in color. And so this is going to be venous blood. Okay, this is venous blood with decreased oxygen content. And we, and we see that it's darker in color. You can see your, your color change here between the two. Okay, so this is venous blood. Venous blood is not blue, uh, you know not like we see in pictures. Venous blood is a darker red because of this deoxyhemoglobin. Okay, now, um, red blood cells also transport carbon dioxide. So it's gonna, red blood cells transport both oxygen and carbon dioxide, right? So what we have is um, when carbon dioxide is being transported by hemoglobin, 
carbon dioxide actually binds to the globin's amino acids. Carbon dioxide does not bind to the heme group like oxygen. This is really important. So it does not bind to the heme group. It does not compete with oxygen for binding sites. Okay? So it binds in a separate place. And really only about 20% of carbon dioxide that's carried in the bloodstream is bound to the hemoglobin's amino acids. The other 80% of carbon dioxide is actually dissolved in the plasma and, and is carried as um, either bicarb or just carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the plasma. Okay, so most of the carbon dioxide is actually dissolved in plasma, not attached to hemoglobin. In terms of red blood cell production, red blood cells are constantly being produced and destroyed. Okay, we have this kind of um, this rate of production equal to destruction of red blood cells. Okay, that's typically what we like to see. If we have too few red blood cells, so if our numbers of red blood cells decrease, what we end up with is tissue hypoxia, which is going to be decreased um, oxygen traveling to um, tissues. That is hypoxia. We, uh, we have another condition of anoxia, which means no oxygen. Okay, but hypoxia is going to be low oxygen. If we have too many red blood cells, so if we have increased red blood cells numbers, what happens is our blood becomes too viscous. It becomes too thick. Okay, it's thick like honey. And this creates an increased resistance to flow, which is not good. Okay, that's not what we want to have happen in our bloodstream. So we'll talk about that too. In terms of, you know, what, what stimulates red blood cells to be produced in the red bone marrow? Well, basically, um, the stimulus for red blood cell production is low oxygen in the blood. Okay, so here's our stimulus. This is really, really important. Decreased oxygen content. In blood and basically what happens is this is measured by chemoreceptors okay so they're constantly measuring the oxygen content in the blood and if they detect decreased oxygen content in the blood those chemoreceptors will stimulate the release of erythropoietin which is a hormone that is produced by the kidneys and the liver, and that stimulates the formation of red blood cells in the red bone marrow. Okay, so this is something I always bring up with my students. There is nothing sitting around counting the number of red blood cells. Okay, but the number of red blood cells determines the level of oxygen in the blood. Okay, that's one of the factors. So if you have low oxygen in the blood, that is what's going to be detected by the chemoreceptors and will stimulate the release of erythropoietin. So if you don't have enough oxygen in your blood, you'll have increased release of erythropoietin. If you have too much oxygen in the blood, or let's say adequate oxygen in the blood, the release of erythropoietin is going to um, be inhibited, and that way we kind of keep a homeostatic level. What we also see is that testosterone in males stimulates the release of erythropoietin, which is why males have increased numbers of, of red blood cells. So male hematocrit is going to be um, higher than female hematocrit. So their hematocrit levels are gonna be increased. And this is basically what it looks like here. So we like to keep a homeostatic blood oxygen level, but if we have the condition of hypoxia, so again, there's our stimulus there, it's hypoxia, okay, decreased oxygen, and this could be due to decreased red blood cell numbers, this could be due, um, related to decreased amounts of hemoglobin, or decreased availability of oxygen, let's say high altitude, right, all of those could create a condition of hypoxia, it's going to stimulate the kidney and the liver to release erythropoietin, which is the hormone 
that's going to stimulate um, red, blood cell, red blood cell production in red bone marrow. We're going to have increased numbers of red blood cells and as a result increased oxygen in blood which is going to be detected by the chemoreceptors and once it gets up to our homeostatic level it's going to shut this off. Okay, so we have some pathology related to red blood cells. So what happens when things go wrong? So one, one thing that happens is anemia. And you might be familiar with this, but anemia is basically a symptom of another pathology. So you've got something else going on and anemia is going to be a symptom of that. So anemia is defined as decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Okay, so we're going to have decreased oxygen in the blood. Some causes of anemia can be blood loss, um, decreased production of red blood cells, and increased destruction of blood cells. So maybe we're destroying our red blood cells at a higher rate than we're producing them. Let's, um, let's go through anemia first, and then we'll come back through um, the polycythemia one. So causes of anemia. Blood loss. That was our first cause of anemia. So we call this specifically hemorrhagic anemia. And this can be either um, a large rapid blood loss, like if you had a traumatic injury and you lost a lot of blood, or this can be a chronic slow loss. So think bleeding ulcer. This is also um, uh, the condition that we see when we have um, females on their um, periods, um, slow um, bleeding that can end up resulting in um, an anemic situation for them. The second cause of anemia is going to be decreased production of red blood cells. So this happens for a couple different reasons. Number one, we can have an iron deficiency anemia. Um, iron is really important. Um, it's needed to make um, erythrocytes, it's needed to make hemoglobin, and it's needed to bind oxygen to the heme group. Okay, So we need iron in several different ways. So if you lack iron, you're going to have issues with all of these steps. Um, pernicious anemia. This is a pretty common um, autoimmune disease that we see in older people. And what happens is the digestive system secretes intrinsic factor, which allows our body to absorb vitamin B12. But what happens in older people is their um, production of intrinsic factor decreases. Therefore, they have less ability to absorb vitamin B12. Well, vitamin B12 is also needed to produce red blood cells. So if we have a vitamin B12 deficiency, that's going to decrease our production of red blood cells. And so this is why a lot of older people will go in and they'll get vitamin B12 injections um, to combat this. Um, renal anemia. So anything renal means kidney. Right? And so what happens here is that you have a lack of erythropoietin um, or the hormone that stimulates red blood cell production. And then we can also have an aplastic anemia, which is basically destruction of red bone marrow. And this can happen from um, a tumor. This can happen from chemo or radiation treatment um, in some cases. So for whatever reason, we've got destroyed red bone marrow, so we're not able to produce the red blood cells. Um, we can also have a third cause of anemia. So maybe we produce the red blood cells, but their destruction rate is increased. So increased um, rate of destruction compared to their rate of production. Okay, so what happens here? A couple different um, genetic conditions. Sickle cell anemia is one um, where the hemoglobin is malformed and um, ruptures easily, so it's not efficient at carrying oxygen. Um, and then thalassemia, um, which um, happens when it's a genetic condition where the globin chains of hemoglobin um, are not formed correctly, and so you'll have red blood cells that lack um, hemoglobin. Okay, and here's our clinical measurements. Um, this is called an H&H. &H. This is hematocrit and hemoglobin. 
okay? And so this is a common clinical measurement that you would see um, done for patients in the hospital. So hematocrit, like we talked about before, um, basically is a measure of the percentage of red blood cells in whole blood, okay? And that was basically that test tube, remember, and the red blood cells sank to the bottom, and we said a typical hematocrit was about 45%. Well, that's what we see here. Males, um, you know, the percentage, you, you might see them change a little bit depending on your source, but um, male is going to be 42 to 52%, female is um, 37 to 47%. So the male is a little bit higher. Do you remember why the male hematocrit is higher? Why do males have more red blood cells? Right? It's the presence of testosterone. Because testosterone tells the kidneys to re release erythropoietin. I think I spelled that terribly wrong, but increased release of erythropoietin, and which is going to lead to increased red blood cell production. Okay? Um, and we'll talk about what happens when we're dehydrated. Um, hemoglobin is going to be a clinical measurement, a lab value that we can do um, looking at amounts of hemoglobin. So here's your male um, and female levels of hemoglobin, um, and it kind of helps to determine causes of anemia because you can actually have a normal hematocrit, but if you don't have enough hemoglobin in your red blood cells, that could actually be a cause of um, anemia. And this is what happens in um, when we're dehydrated. So let's look at this. This would be a normal um, vial of whole blood. And here's our, here's our red blood cells here, right? Here's our normal hematocrit at about 45%. Here's a condition of anemia where we've got a low hematocrit. You know, it's closer to about 30%. So that would classify them as um, anemic with a decreased red blood cell count and as a result, obviously a decreased oxygen carrying capability of the blood. Um, we haven't talked about polycythemia yet, but polycythemia happens when you have increased numbers of red blood cells. And that's what we see here. Look how, look how much of this is red blood cells, right? So what happens in dehydration? When you're dehydrated, your blood volume decreases. So your plasma volume, oops, plasma volume is going to decrease, okay? Now, if I look at my, my absolute amount of red blood cells, it's actually the same as it is in my normal blood. So, like, if I draw this line over, I'm not going to be able to draw a straight line, but if I draw this over, it's going to be the same as my normal. Well, because red blood cell, I mean, um, hematocrit is expressed as a percentage of your red blood cells to your total blood volume, and here my total blood volume is much less because my plasma volume is decreased. Um, it looks like the red blood cells account for a larger percentage of that total blood volume. Here we're up to like 70%. So what does this mean? If you have a patient who comes in and they are dehydrated, it can give you a falsely elevated hematocrit. Okay, falsely elevated hematocrit. It makes the hematocrit look like it's much bigger than it actually is because that patient is dehydrated. So that's why it's important to be hydrated when you, when you do lab tests like this.